and gentlemen, welcome to Corona Chemistry, where we are now going to discuss the different types, or should I say mechanisms, of chemical reactions, along with exploring redox, exploring nanionic equations. What an exciting time. This is the epitome of chemistry. Welcome aboard. If this is your first time being here, you should probably know something. You can grab your own copy of notes and these slides that you're looking at directly above my beautiful cranium just below this video, along with the other resources that we're going to be utilizing in this video, which include the activity series, along with solubility rules. That is going to be very, very, very important for you. Anyways, let's get started. We're talking about chemical equations and reactions. It is very important if you are not comfortable with nomenclature. If you are not comfortable with nomenclature, it is not recommended that you proceed. Nomenclature is super instrumental in being able to uh, maximize your ability to tackle these reactions and their mechanisms because not only are you just going to have to be able to recognize them, you are going to have to be able to write them yourself. And if someone is giving you the word equation for something, you need to be able to write down accurately what they are portraying and what they're trying to uh, get you to write. So anyways, let's go in to the beginning. Here we go. There are five mechanisms that we are going to be discussing and there's technically not five types there's actually only three types of reactions but we are going to be discussing the five most basic mechanisms not every reaction in the entire world falls into these categories okay ladies and gentlemen there are going to be various reactions where we are going to give you the left side i should i guess i should do it over here the reactant side and you have to predict the product side and not only that, if I give you a full reaction, can you categorize it into the five basic mechanisms? But you also need to be able to write equations from words, as I just said. Okay? So a couple of very, very key things to remember. When I am writing down ionic compounds, am I remembering to crisscross those charges? If you are not crisscrossing those charges, you are setting yourself up for failure. If you are just smushing a metal and a nonmetal together to form an ionic compound, you're going to be wrong 99% of the time. Okay, we have to consider their charges. But here's something that's kind of new. If you haven't heard this before, very important. Diatomic elements. These are elements that like to march two by two, just like the animals boarding Noah's Ark. Whenever they are alone, they are not actually alone. And what are those elements? Brinkelhoff. Brinkelhoff. Just say it to yourself right now. Brinkelhoff. I'll give you a second. Yeah, you sound great. Brinkelhoff. Seven elements, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine. I prefer to just say Brinkelhoff. I've heard that, I've heard many teachers explain that it makes a seven. Wow, I actually did that reversed on the camera so it would look like a, look like a seven for you guys. Wow, I'm getting really good at this. Uh, anyways, that it makes sort of a seven on the periodic table, and that is true with uh, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, bromine, iodine, and chlorine. However, you just have to remember that hydrogen's in the top left corner of the periodic table, so don't forget him. He's very, very, very important. But those are diatomic elements. So we are going to explore a couple of these examples to get a little bit of practice, perhaps a little bit of a review from nomenclature, and to make sure that we are considering all of the potential variables here. Are we crisscrossing? And are we brinkle hoffing? So here we go. we got two equations that we're going to be practicing. Sodium chloride and silver nitrate react to form sodium nitrate and silver chloride. So they're giving us the full equation. We just have to write it down accurately. Magnesium and oxygen react to form magnesium oxide. Okay, let's go to the board, ladies and gentlemen. Here we are writing our first reactions when they are given to us via a word equation. And our first reaction is going to be sodium chloride and silver nitrates. That's what we're going to start off with. And remember, these are both ionic compounds. And as is the case with this specific mechanism of reaction that we're going to go into further detail here pretty soon, um, they're mostly ionic compounds that you're working with. Therefore, you need to crisscross your charges every single time. So make sure you got that periodic table handy unless you've memorized the charges of these different cations and anions. So we've got sodium chloride, which is a combination, of course, of sodium and chlorine. They both have charges of one, so nothing too fancy there. That's going to crisscross to form an ACL. No big deal there. Then we've got silver nitrate. Silver, of course, always has a charge of one. In nitrate always has a charge of negative one. So once again, nothing fancy here. These guys can just smush together. And they react to form sodium nitrate and silver chloride. Well, 
Everything has a charge of one here. So actually, this is as boring as they come. You could get away with just smushing their symbols together. So silver and, or sorry, sodium and nitrate are going to get together. NaNO3 plus silver chloride, like so, right? And because everything has a charge of one, everything is actually already balanced. So there's nothing more that you need to do here. Our next example is between magnesium and oxygen gas. And here's what the number one mistake is going to be. Magnesium plus oxygen gas. The problem with that is with this element right here. Oxygen is a diatomic element, which means he is never on his own. If it ever says oxygen gas, it can't just be O, it has to be O2. And that goes for all of the Brinkelhoff elements. Bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine. You got dogs scurrying in the hallway right outside. And this is going to form magnesium oxide, but we can't just smush these together. We have to account for their charges. Magnesium has a charge of two. Oxygen also has a charge of two. Well, remember when they have the same charges when they crisscross, they can actually reduce down to form MgO. And you might be asking yourself right now, well, where's that two go? The two doesn't go anywhere. This is why we balance afterwards. The formula is independent of what you started with. Right? We are going to balance the equation now. And so because I started with two oxygens, I need to end with two oxygens. So I'm going to put a two out here in front. But now I've got two magnesiums, which means I need to begin with two magnesiums, like so. And that is how to write a chemical reaction. All right, with that now out of the way, let's get into our actual mechanisms of reaction. This is probably the most simple mechanism. However, can be one of the more frustrating ones to predict, and we'll get into that here in a second. But this is known as a synthesis reaction, also called a composition reaction. It's just like cooking, multiple ingredients becoming one product. And so it's very easy to recognize if you are given the entire reaction. We have hypothetical A plus hypothetical X yields AX. Two reactants becoming one product. And it doesn't just have to be two reactants. It's, it's all we're looking for is if there's a plus sign on the reactant side and no plus sign on the product side. You can have multiple, multiple reactants becoming one product. More than one reactant making one product. So it's very easy to recognize from that standpoint. However, we're going to take a look at some patterns that aren't completely intuitive to predict unless you're really, really experienced with this. But let's look at one of our first examples. Metal plus oxygen. A metal plus oxygen makes a metal oxide. So hopefully now, with just that very first example, you're starting to see why nomenclature is super, super, super important. Metal plus oxygen yields a metal oxide. I've got two individual ingredients. Notice the O2, Brinkelhoff. Remember, Brinkelhoff. And it yields one product. So all we did was we crisscrossed those charges, and we make a singular product. And just for this one, we do, in fact, have, we do have a video example. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Take a look. Magnesiums to react with. I don't want to steal that guy's audio. He sounds great. He sounds so intelligent. But look at this. The match is providing the oxygen. Then the magnesium strip that's obviously clamped um, to this ring stand right here. It ignites and reveals a bright, 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 bright light. Oh my goodness. One of our textbook's examples of a chemical reaction. Very, very cool. And it's this white powdery, white powdery substance that's flaking on. I know it doesn't really look like a powder now, but. I guarantee you it's going to fall down here. In a, let's see if it does. It's going to fall down here momentarily. And when it gets to the bottom, it's so crumbly. You could crumble it together in your hands. And that is the product. That is the magnesium oxide that we are looking at. So I think I would say most kids would be very good at being able to interpret this as a synthesis reaction, right? I've got a plus sign on the left. I do not have a plus sign on the product side. Pretty safe to say, right? And we're going to see that pattern for the next couple of examples. Metal plus sulfur makes a metal sulfide. Not any different from the one that we just saw. However, this one's a little weird because sulfur, sulfur is kind of like a Brinkelhoff element in that he doesn't travel alone. He travels in groups of eight. And the only other example that's like this is actually phosphorus. Phosphorus, when alone, is not actually alone. Phosphorus travels in groups of four. So if I ever saw phosphorus written um, elementally as just an element, it would be P4 solid, um, just like sulfur is S8 solid. And so we, we think of these diatomic elements, Brinkelhoff. We might want to also add a little asterisk at the bottom, right? P4 
P.S. You know, like you would in a letter or an email, something like that. P.S. For phosphorus and sulfur because they're kind of weird as well. But that's a kind of an obscure, uh, obscure concept that I, I wouldn't anticipate to be shown in, you know, most high school curriculums. But you know what? Let's keep it spicy here. Let's keep it heated, okay? Next, metal halogens. A metal plus a halogen makes a metal halide. These are what are known as binary synthesis compounds. Binary, meaning I start with an element and an element. Therefore, the only thing they could possibly make on the product side is a compound with those two elements, right? Obviously, I look like I'm doing some sort of Power Ranger move right here. Uh, but anyways, these are known as binary compounds. If you only start with two elements, what's the only thing you can make? A compound with those two elements, right? We can't just have a random other element get thrown into the mix here. That wouldn't make sense, right? And so all of the examples we've shown you thus far are examples of binary synthesis compounds, okay? But now, here's where we get into the, I would say, less intuitive, and yet you still want to be able to predict the products of these reactions. A metallic oxide and water forms a base. How do I know what a base is? Well, let, let's keep it really, really simple for this video. A base is any metal attached to a hydroxide, right? Remember, hydroxide is a polyatomic ion. There are only O's in chemistry, never ho's in chemistry, right? Remember? Um, so, a metallic oxide and water forms a base. And remember, you can tell that by a metal attached to hydroxide. But in order to interpret this as the pattern that it is, I have to be able to recognize that this is a metallic oxide, which if you're looking at it with the context of this video, that might not, might not be so hard to do. But without practice and without my beautiful melodic voice echoing in your ear canals, you might not remember that. And so nomenclature is super, super important. Obviously, H2O is water. Not... Not a problem there. Uh, and also, we will talk about these little subscripts um, a little bit later. Um, I think we could probably infer the S and the L. Uh, that stands for solid and liquid, and obviously a G would be a gas. AQ we'll talk about a little bit later. AQ stands for aqueous, which means it dissolves in water, if you had a question about that. So a metallic oxide in water forms a base. Well, and hopefully we know what the opposite of a base is. A non-metallic oxide in water forms the opposite of a base, an acid. And this is actually what causes acid rain in the sky. Sulfur dioxide in water makes sulfurous acid here. Sulfurous acid. And we can talk about this here, but and you might be wondering, how do I know what acid is going to pr produce? That's not that hard, right? Just count up your oxygens, count up your hydrogens, and count up how many of that non-metal element you've got there, smoosh them together, right? We know this is a synthesis reaction. We know we're going to produce one product. It is going to produce the most convenient product, aka the most simple product, right? There is the off chance that it could produce a different product. Not the case here, okay? Chemistry, when, chemistry is going to take the most convenient route possible. And so what I count on the left is one, two, three oxygens. I count two hydrogens. I count one sulfur. That's what I'm going to have on the product side, if that's possible, if that's possible. Uh, and so because we know it's going to form an acid, we know the hydrogen is going to come first. And then uh, we know all of our polyatomic ions from naming our acids. The oxygen always comes last. And so sulfur is just going to get smushed right in the middle. And so with a little bit of practice, those become extremely intuitive as well. And so those are the main synthesis patterns that we're going to see. So most of those were binary. The next example of a mechanism of chemical reactions is decomposition. It's the exact opposite, right? Remember the other name for a synthesis reaction is composition? Well, decomposition, of course, is the opposite. This is where I start with one reactant, and I'm going to end with multiple products. And of course, because we are breaking things apart, we are breaking chemical bonds, this usually requires the input of energy, right? This usually requires the input of energy. And so this is the exact opposite. So you're going to see some familiar patterns just flipped. By the way, there are some chemical reactions, of course, that are completely reversible. There are chemical reactions that are completely reversible. But just as it was with binary synthesis reactions, binary decomposition reactions are incredibly easy to predict as well. If I have a compound that only has two elements in it, then obviously when it is breaking down, it can only break down into those two elements. I feel like that's not too big brain of a concept. If I start with two things and I'm breaking them apart, what's the only thing they can produce? Those two things, right? So water is going to break down into 
hydrogen and oxygen. And yes, I understand that these reactions are not balanced, which, by the way, balancing is incredibly important in writing these reactions. Balancing is incredibly important. It's not a concept that I take too much time teaching on um, because a lot of us are you know, mostly familiar with it. But that's certainly something you want to be good and comfortable with moving into the next few units of this course. Uh, but either way, remember, Brinkelhoff, that's why it's H2 and O2, not just H and O. Uh, lithium and nitrogen, Brinkelhoff once again making an appearance. Brinkelhoff's happening all the time. And remember our funky, funky sulfur. It's not just S, it's S8. Okay, so we've got those examples popping up everywhere. But these are binary compounds. So let's go into the less intuitive products, the less intuitive decomposition reactions that we have to predict. Well, a carbonate... A carbonate, a metal carbonate specifically, is going to break down into a metal oxide and carbon dioxide gas. A metal oxide and carbon dioxide gas. And this is kind of similar, sort of like the mirror flipping of that acid prediction reaction I was just ta talking to you guys about. First of all, we have to be able to recognize that this is a metal carbonate, calcium, a metal carbonate, a polyatomic ion, CO3 with the charge of negative 2. Uh, it's going to form a metal oxide, so I need to know what the heck that looks like. Nomenclature is so, so, so important, but notice how simple it is. How many oxygens do you have on the left? Three. It's going to break into a very convenient ratio. It's going to keep it as simple as possible. And so these three are going to split into the two compounds. And so I feel like I, I said this wasn't intuitive, and yet it sort of is. It sort of is, but you have to know what two components it's going to break into, a metal oxide and carbon dioxide gas. Well, this had a different name just a couple slides ago, if you're really paying attention. A metal hydroxide is also known as a base, whereas a metal oxide and water forms a base, a base will break down into a metal oxide and water. It's the exact opposite of that synthesis reaction we just talked about. And just as there was the opposite for the formation of bases, there is the opposite for the formation of acids. This right here, carbonic acid. This is a very important reaction for a lot of you guys. If you drink soda, this is what makes soda kind of spicy, right? You know, when it hits the tongue, it, whoo, whoo, there's a flair to it, right? A little bit of, a little kick to it, a little spice, right? That's actually when the CO2 Obviously, that's the carbonation that they're adding. That's how you get the bubbles, the fizziness, right? It's reacting with the water, and it's forming carbonic acid. That gives it that little that little kick. That, oh, that, you can't even describe it, but it's why Dr. Pepper, it's one of its 23 original flavors, carbonic acid, right? Completely 23 natural flavors. But either way, acids breaking down into nonmetal oxides in water, the exact flip of what we just talked about with the synthesis reactions. And then our very last pattern. Our very last pattern of the day for synthesis and decomp, I should say. A metal chlorate is going to break down into a metal chloride and oxygen gas. A metal chloride and oxygen gas. And this is the one where I would say balancing is going to be more important because the ratios don't work out as conveniently as the other examples. Because, because chlorate is... The polyatomic ion is always ClO3, and we are obviously – we are always going to produce oxygen gas, which is O2. We do have to pay attention to the balancing here. I would say this is probably the least intuitive um, out of all of the different decomposition scenarios that we have just been presented with personally. But it takes practice. These take practice. And so it's very easy to recognize that this is a decomposition reaction. However, if I only gave you the left side of this reaction – it's going to obviously take practice in order for you to predict what's on the right side, right? So you've got to practice. You've got to practice, all right? Let's go into what is perhaps my favorite mechanism of reaction. That's already two down. Only three to go. Single replacement. Single replacement is a, it's a story that I personally click with. Let's tell a little story here. Let's tell a little story, okay? And let, let's first of all, let's look at this reaction. Okay, hypothetical A plus BX yields B plus AX. I really resonate with this story, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not going to lie. Okay, listen. This is a story about upgrading. This is a story about finding the love of your life, your true match. This is a story about Mr. Steel, yo girl. Okay, uh, I'm married as of last summer, and my goodness. I lived this story. I was Mr. Steelio Girl. But let's not dwell on that. Let's not. Come on. This isn't about me. 
let's make this about a hypothetical story, okay? Let's let's say, oh gosh, let's say we we've got a, a young lad, okay? He, he's he's misunderstood. He's incredibly debonair looking. He's incredibly handsome. He's got excellent biceps, excellent just body figure in, in general. He, he takes care of himself, okay? He takes care of himself, and uh, not the most social. At first, not the most social at first. Okay, it couldn't be me. And so they, they, they get encouraged. The, the mom encourages him. You, you gotta go to the dance. Come on, it's your senior year. You gotta go to the homecoming dance. You've got to. It's, it's one of the high school experiences that you have to experience, right? But it, I don't know. To him, the options were slim. He's focusing on himself. But there was one girl. There was one girl. And this girl had fielded a bunch of offers. Bunch of offers. Um, but it's, none of them felt right, right? You can tell I'm emotionally invested in this story. None of them felt right. Um, anyways, it, it's, it's a couple weeks away from the big dance and wow, she's turned down all these offers and my goodness, my goodness, my goodness. Um, she's got to secure a date, right? So whoever the next guy is that offers her, uh, you know, whatever the homecoming offering was, she was going to accept, right? You got to make sure you got a date for the dance, right? Well, so so long comes um so long comes Barry, okay. Let's just call him Barry with a B, right? There's nothing wrong with him. He's got some good features. He's average, right? He's got some good features. Anyways, they go to the dance. Um, he's got some weird moves. He also brought a Tupperware container of fettuccine Alfredo with him out onto the dance floor that he was hiding in his suit pocket for whatever reason. I. I don't know, emergency fettuccine. I don't think it's the worst idea, but for a dance floor, I don't know. Um, but anyways, this girl, let's call her xylophone, okay, with an X, is scanning the dance floor for better options, for better upgrades. And so long comes it previously misunderstood, not not very social, but great features. Not Just great features. He went to the dance. The mom encouraged him. He goes to the dance. <sighs> He's so handsome, it, ruggedly handsome, I would say. And as Barry goes to go and secure uh, his date and, and himself some punch, this previously misunderstood antisocial guy walks up to her going, all right, all right, all right, can I have this dance? And the rest is history. Mr. Steelio Girl. I'm not going to say Matthew McConaughey is always the better option, but isn't he? Isn't he always the better option? I, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with, with this guy over here, okay? I literally Googled average-looking guy, okay? If if this guy is one of the guys watching this video, I am so sorry. I think you're beautiful. But Matthew McConaughey, come on. If you know that reference, okay, you're a cultured individual. Anyways, back to it. This is chemistry. This is the chemistry of upgrading. Obviously, Barry got replaced. Barry's single at the end of the night. Goes into the night with a beautiful woman on his arm, but leaves the night single. Devastatingly so. Devastating. This is the chemistry of upgrades. Now, if only us humans in the real world could know where we, where we were positioned on the totem pole. If only we knew. If only there was a list. You know how we rank people 1 to 10 in their hotness, whatever, 0 to 10? In chemistry, they actually do. Except for they don't, call it the, they don't call it anything cool like that. They call it the activity series. But I call it the chemistry hot or not list. Because where you are on this list determines how freaking hot you are. How willing someone is to replace who they're currently with, with you. And ladies and gentlemen, lithium is the Matthew McConaughey of chemistry. Lithium is always the better choice. Let's say that Barry from this scenario was like iron. He's middle of the pack. I'm not saying that they, I'm not saying he's a bad choice, but he's certainly not the best choice. And so ladies and gentlemen, this list is what determines whether or not the reaction happens. Because if you're already with Matthew McConaughey, does it get better from here? Does it get better than lithium? The answer is no. And so, 
if someone is swooping in to try to be Mr. Steal Your Girl and steal Matthew McConaughey's girl? It doesn't happen. The answer is no reaction. That is a potential option here. If a less reactive element is trying to replace a more reactive element, there is a potential for no reaction here. But you got to keep in mind, we can only replace elements that behave like, like ourselves, okay? In the real world, anyone can get with anyone, right? It's 2020. I think life is, yeah, that's happening out there. Anyone can get with anyone. But in chemistry, metals can only replace things that behave like metals, and non-metals can only replace things that behave like non-metals, okay? Cations can only replace cations. Anions can only replace anions. It's incredibly important to know, right? We didn't necessarily talk about this example, but we will very, very, very shortly. So let's look at a few examples of this, right? And there's a very simple way of approaching this. And they're very easy to recognize as well, even if you're only given the left side of the reaction, because you're going to see someone that is alone next to a happy couple. But does the reaction always happen? Absolutely not. I have to then analyze the activity series. So let's look at a couple of examples on the board in order to really, really examine this. If you don't have your own activity series, you can look at this one on this set of slides or you can grab the link that I put just below this video. All right, let's go to the board. Here we are with our single replacement examples that we're gonna be doing on the board. We have magnesium plus gold two oxide yields. We have gold plus magnesium oxide yields. So notice that these two are just completely flipped one another. One of them obviously can't happen. And remember, the single replacement uh, reaction is based upon the activity series. The goal is for the more reactive metal or a nonmetal to take the place of the less reactive metal or nonmetal. So in either case, what you want to look at is look at who is single, and we need to see if they are hot enough to be Mr. Steal Your Girl by the end of the night. So we're going to look at the activity series here. And if we're looking at it, right, we actually see that gold is towards the very bottom. Gold is very beautiful on the outside, but has a despicable personality. He never calls his mother. Really? And he has horrible body odor. Great features. Horrible body odor. Doesn't call his mother. Red flags, ladies. Red flags. Okay? So anyways, magnesium is able to be Mr. Steel Yo Girl, which means... Gold is going to be alone at the end of the night. And then I just have to make sure that I crisscross my charges appropriately with, appropriately between magnesium and oxygen. Well, they both have charges of two. Therefore, it's just MgO. So I don't even have to balance this equation any further. Which means that this reaction can't happen. Gold is not reactive enough to replace magnesium. Therefore, this gets a big old whopping NR for no reaction. There's just no chemistry here. And then remember what we said in the video just before this one, that metals can only replace metals or things that behave like metals, and non-metals can only replace non-metals. So when I'm looking at fluorine right here, it's not looking to replace lithium because lithium is a metal. Fluorine wants to get with lithium. This isn't a case of Mr. Steel, your man. Fluorine, 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 fluorine. Please don't take my man just because you can Fluorine can always take your man. That's the thing. Fluorine can always take your man. But how do I know this? There's no activity series for nonmetals. You're right. What you're going to look at is the halogen family, because those are the only elements that we're going to utilize for this type of reaction. Halogens. And the higher you are on the periodic table, literally, the higher you are on the periodic table, the more reactive you are, which means fluorine is the most reactive, then chlorine, then bromine, and then iodine. You don't want to be caught in public with iodine. No way. No way. So fluorine is able to replace bromine, which means bromine is going to be single at the end of the night. However, remember, bromine is the br in Brinkelhoff, therefore it can't just be Br, has to be Br2. And fluorine is going to get with lithium. They both have charges of one, therefore it's just LIF. Notice our balancing is off because I've got two bromines on the right when I've only got one on the left. I've got one fluorine on the right when I've got two on the left. So if I put a pair of twos down. And it's kind of hard to read. Let's see if we can make this look a little bit better. Buh, 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 buh. Look at that. Like so. And there we have it, single replacement reactions.
Now let's get into our fourth mechanism, which is known as double replacement, which is the easiest to predict once you get a little bit of practice. But seeing as most of you are brand spanking new to this topic, it's also one of the easiest to mess up. And the reason why is because you are typically going to be asked to predict the entire right side of the reaction, uh, predict the products. And if you're not remembering to crisscross or if you're not crisscrossing properly, if you didn't get that down in the nomenclature unit, then you're going to struggle with this part. And there's several topics that branch out from these types of reactions, the double replacement reactions. But first of all, we need to talk about why this reaction is happening. Remember the single replacement reaction, the cause for it happening was the more reactive metal or non-metal is taking the spot of the less reactive metal or non-metal, right? There's a reason for it. A double replacement reaction happens for one of three things. And it's trying to produce either A, a precipitate. I don't know why I'm saying A when there's literally numbers right next to it. So let's say one, a precipitate, which if you recall what precipitate is, that is a solid product produced from uh, two aqueous reactants. That's what we're talking about. And what are those aqueous reactants? Typically what we're working with here is something dissolved in water. Okay. Most of these reactions are taking place in water or taking place in solution is what you'll see. Okay. Uh, or two, oops. Oh, man, we went the wrong way. Or two, the formation of a gas. And as far as this course is concerned, we won't be using any of those examples, but they are out there. Or three, the formation of a molecular compound like water. Forming water is what you're going for. I would say nine times out of ten, we are going to be forming a precipitate. Water is that one time out of ten that we're going to see on several different occasions. And that's because it's a very specific reaction, and that's between an acid and a base. Uh, but we will not be seeing any examples in which a gas is formed, at least not in this video. And then, if none of these are accomplished, then it is no reaction. Just like in the single replacement reaction, uh, single replacement reaction, there's the potential for it not to occur. Double replacement also has that potential. If we don't accomplish one of these three goals, aka what that means is all of our substances involved in both the reactants and the product side of the equation, the reaction, are aqueous. So we did make a precipitate, we didn't make a gas. We didn't make a water. And so now what you're saying is how the heck do we know what is aqueous and what is not? Ah, my child, that is where the solubility rules come in. And so please access the chart that I like to use or one of the charts that I like to use just below this video if you do not already have your own. OK, but first, what are we going to see in these reactions? We're going to see various symbols. Uh, we've already clarified these a little bit earlier in the video. S is for solid, L is for liquid, and yes, that is always referring to water, so it's always going to be attached to water. Uh, and then gas, usually examples that you would recognize, CO2, O2, that sort of thing. Uh, and then AQ is your new one. AQ means this is something that is soluble in water, something that is able to be dissolved. And we are going to look at the solubility rules here in just a second so that you know what the heck I'm talking about. Um, but the solubility rules are going to tell you whether or not it is going to be aqueous. If it does not dissolve in water, you're going to put an S next to it. And that is going to be a precipitate that is produced in your reaction. Solid meaning it does not dissolve. It's very easy to put an S next to something because S for soluble, right? A lot of kids make that mistake. S is for solid, not for soluble. Okay. And so we're going to look at these examples here in conjunction with the solubility rules now. So here we are with our solubility rules, and there's tons of them out there, right? There's tons of different ways of organizing it. You find the one that you like the best, right? You don't have to pick the one. I, I, this is one of the first ones that pops up on Google, right? This isn't the one I use in class, but it's very conveniently placed in Google Images, right? And it'll serve the purposes that we need here. Uh, so notice m most of them are sorted this way as well. It's sorted by soluble compounds and insoluble compounds. But you have to note what it's doing on the right side over here. So it lists the exceptions on the right. So traditionally, any metal attached to these polyatomic ions and or anions are soluble unless the thing attached to it is one of these. That's how it's read. Down here, traditionally, these anions are insoluble unless attached to one of these. That's how you read it. So utilize these rules to go back and solve these. Notice we're, we've got scandium 2 nitrate right here. But if we go to the chart here, nitrates are soluble except for nothing. All of them are soluble. Anything attached to a nitrate is always, always, always soluble. 
Next, silver bromide. We go to our rules. Bromides are soluble unless attached to silver, mercury 2, mercury 1, sorry, mercury 1, or lead 2. But silver is the one that we're attached to. Therefore, AGBR is insoluble and would get that special little S symbol next to it. Lead 2 sulfate, here we go. Sulfates are soluble unless attached to strontium, barium, mercury 1, and or lead 2. And guess what we're attached to? Lead 2 sulfate. Therefore, this would be a precipitate as well. Uh, next, magnesium hydroxide. Hydroxides are insoluble unless attached to alkali metals, ammonium, calcium, strontium, and barium. Magnesium is not on this list. Also, magnesium is not an alkali metal. Therefore, this is an insoluble compound and should have an S next to it. Barium sulfide. Sulfides are insoluble unless attached to ammonium, alkali metals, calcium, strontium, and barium. So barium sulfide is a soluble compound. So that's how you read that chart. Like I said, lots of charts out there, lots of different ways to organize it. Uh, if you're going to take AP chemistry, it is almost certain that you're going to have to memorize the solubility rules. So if that's something that you are, are planning on taking next year, it's not a bad idea to start memorizing them now. Uh, but until then, I would say... Most classes are going to allow you to use your solubility rules throughout your uh, ground level, your pre-AP, your advanced chemistry, before you actually take AP chemistry. So let's take a double replacement reactions. And we're going to do a couple of these examples on the board, right, because it does take practice. And so we'll probably do examples that aren't in the slides. Um, but notice what's happening here. The double replacement reaction from our template right here, we have two different happy couples. The way I like to think of this is swing dancing. Right? If you've ever, maybe you've never been swing dancing yourself, right? But you've got a partner, you're locked in the arm with them, you're spinning around in circles, and when you get to the other side of the circle, you detach. And you link up with someone new. And so that's what's happening here. A is with X, B is with Y, but on the other side, B is with X, A is with Y. So the way I always think of this is as the metal, it's, I think of it as the metal switching places. I think of it as the metals switching places, right? And remember the reason why. We are looking to create a precipitate or water on the product side of the reaction. So we are going to predict our products, and then we assess whether or not we've actually met our goal that we're going for. So when I look at this reaction right here, silver nitrate and sodium chloride are going to form, theoretically, sodium nitrate and silver chloride. These symbols are not given to me necessarily. I might have to go to my solubility rules and determine whether or not uh, one of them is a solid, one of them is a precipitate. And silver chloride, if we go our solubility rules, is a precipitate according to it. So once I have assessed that and I have assigned the proper symbols to this reaction, then I know that I have met one of my goals. Therefore, this is good to go. Therefore, this is a solid reaction. Uh, this is going to happen. Solutions of magnesium fluoride and potassium hydroxide, right? We settle it all the way through, but oh my goodness, we have magnesium hydroxide and potassium fluoride, right? Fluorides aren't on this solubility chart specifically. However, a little shortcut here, anything attached to an alkali metal is always soluble. Potassium is an alkali metal, so that's going to be aqueous. Uh, and I understand that the aqueous symbol is already written there for you. Um, but let's take a look at magnesium hydroxide just to double check this one. Hydroxides are insoluble unless... Attached to alkali metals, ammonium, calcium, strontium, or barium. Magnesium is not on that list. We just talked about this, actually, I think, in the previous slide. Um, so this should not technically be aqueous. This should be a precipitate right here. However, if we were to leave this as aqueous, and if this were a true statement, notice how all four of the substances are aqueous, right? You're always going to start with two aqueous reactants. But if both of your products are aqueous, this is a no reaction. This is a no reaction. However... This is much more accurate. Magnesium hydroxide, not soluble. It's possible that another, because uh, I, I, I pulled these reactions offline, it's possible that magnesium hydroxide is right on the border of being soluble in water versus not soluble in water. Um, and everything is soluble in water to at least the smallest degree, right? just depends on how small amount of stuff that you're putting into, you know, how large amount of water. Um, so you can dissolve anything. You just need enough water to do it, right? Right? You just need enough, okay? But we've got more examples here, but let's do a couple on the board. Okay. 
Here we are doing our double replacement examples. We have barium chloride plus sodium sulfate yields. And we also have an acid-base reaction between sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. Notice that we've already given the aqueous uh, denotations to all of them. And you might be asking yourself, how do I know uh, that specifically this one is aqueous? Well, that's because actually all acids are aqueous. And that's just a fact that you might want to internalize. Um, I've never actually seen acids shown on the solubility rules because they are all aqueous. So it would be kind of redundant to put it there. Um, on top of that, if you don't have your own solubility rules out already and you haven't memorized them, probably be a good idea to pause this video and grab those right now, um, which you should have already done in the previous clip here. But as I said before, I always think of these double replacement reactions as the metals switching places. But if you're familiar with algebra and you know the FOIL method, um, I had a student a year ago say that she thinks of it this way. The outside guy is getting together and the inside guy is getting together. She called it a double smile. Um, but I think it really looks like that FOIL method that you learn in algebra. Just remember that whenever you write the formula here in the center, that the metal always comes first. So we always write the cation and then the anion. Um, so then we have our predicted products on the other side, and then we're going to determine whether or not this reaction actually happens. Because remember, we had to accomplish one of three things. We had to make a precipitate, we have to make water, or we have to make a gas. But we're never going to see that, um, that kind uh, in this course, at least. So anyways, barium is going to get with sulfates, and they both have charges of two. So we just smush those together. And then sodium is going to get with chlorine. They both have charges of one. And then if you notice, we had two sodiums and two chlorines on the left. So in order to balance it, I'm going to need a two right here. But we still don't know if this reaction happens yet. Because I obviously didn't make a gas. It's very hard to turn a metal into a gas. I didn't make water. I don't see an H2O. So I need to find out if one of these products is a precipitate. And I know it's a precipitate by looking at the solubility rules. And we look at the solubility rules and we find out that anything attached to an alkali metal is always soluble without fail. So anything attached to sodium will always be aqueous. But then we look at the solubility rules and we determine that barium sulfate does not dissolve well in water and is our precipitate. Therefore, this reaction happens. Remember, if this guy were also aqueous, that would mean both of your products are aqueous. That would be a no reaction. If both of your products are aqueous, it is a no reaction. Next, we have an acid-base reaction, which is called a neutralization reaction, which is actually a type of reaction, not a mechanism, a type of reaction. And it works the exact same way as a double replacement. The sodium and the hydrogen are going to switch places, or you can do that double smile method, right? The hydrogen is going to give it the hydroxide, and the sodium is going to give it the chlorine. I think we've written the NaCl enough to know that that's what it's going to make. And then HOH. Two hydrogens, one oxygen. Oh, that's water. Brilliant. Sorry, my dogs are barking right now. They just got a bath. So they're trying to take the power back. That's what they do. Anyways, we're looking at it here. We know salt dissolves in water. But does, does this reaction happen? And the answer is yes, because one of my products is water. And water gets an L for liquid next to it. Remember, we want to make a precipitate, we want to make water, or we want to make a gas. And an acid-base reaction always makes water. It makes a salt in water, actually. It doesn't always mean table salt, right? This is salt that you could sprinkle on your french fries. But a salt in chemistry simply means cation with an anion, essentially an, uh, an ionic compound is what you're looking for here. And so you can't sprinkle all salts in your french fries. That could result in massive amounts of gastrointestinal hemorrhaging. Uh, so don't do that. This is good salt. Not all salt is salt for the french fries, okay? Just stick to the packets, okay? You'll be good. Moving on to our fifth and final mechanism of reaction for discussion today. We have combustion. Oh my goodness, in your face with that one. Yowza, yowza. Yes, that's what a combustion reaction looks like. Now, sometimes it's on a much smaller scale, but the explosion, the light, the, the energy produced, that textbook combustion reaction. Perhaps the easiest mechanism that we've discussed today, though, because the only thing that changes is the fuel that you are igniting. It is always a fuel plus oxygen and produces the same two products every single time, carbon dioxide and water, always. 
that makes it super easy to recognize and also super easy to predict on the other side. This right here, if you're using the Bunsen burner jets in a standard classroom, it pumps out methane gas. That is your fuel. And then you apply a match or a lighter to the top of your Bunsen burner, which is going to ignite it. But what are you doing with that match or that, that fire on the end of your lighter? You are providing oxygen to the reaction, and then it's going to produce CO2 and water. And you might be saying to yourself, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't see water coming off the top of my Bunsen burner. It's not like I can hold my mouth over it and get a, a drink when I'm thirsty. No, you cannot. It is producing water vapor almost always. However, there are some examples of combustion reactions in which you can actually tangibly see the water produced, right? There's ways to capture it, but most of the time it's going to be water vapor expelled into the atmosphere and you're never going to see it again, right? But it makes it to where this is very, very, very simple to recognize, uh, very simple to uh, balance in the end. There's a little trick to balancing because they can get kind of weird, but there's a shortcut to balancing. So let's look at a couple of reactions. Uh, first of all, this one is the weirdest example that I think there is for combustion um, because it's not producing two products. It's only producing the one. And this looks, it, it is a synthesis reaction, but the the actual textbook definition of combustion is that it only has to produce water. In almost in every other case aside from this one, it's going to produce water and carbon dioxide. But I just, I just I want you to realize, okay, this is an example of a combustion reaction, albeit a weird one. This is what most of them are going to look like. And you might have your, your dad and the New Balances and high white socks in the backyard with the cargo shorts at the grill. This is what he's working with here. This is the propane down below in the grill. He ignites it with the oxygen gas once again, produces the same carbon dioxide and water. No, this is not balanced. You have to balance it. How do I do it? Well, this one is kind of a simple one. So let's do a spicier one. Let's do these examples, which are much more difficult, right, at first glance. However, there's a shortcut. And we're going to utilize what I like to call, for dramatic effect, I paused, Tucho. Tucho. Here we are balancing our complex examples, complex examples of combustion reactions. And yes, you can do the guess and check method. There's nothing wrong with that. You can balance one element at a time. It's advised that you save oxygen for last, and we'll talk about that here in a second. But there's a shortcut, okay? I'd like to say that I trademarked it, okay? I don't know if that's true but I'd like to say that I'm the only one who's come up with this and people are just piggybacking off of my massive brain ever since. But I call it Tucho. Tucho. And what that means is you're going to put a two in front of your fuel and then balance it in order of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Okay? And your fuel is the only thing that is unique to every combustion reaction. Everything else stays the same, right? You're always adding oxygen and you're always producing the same two products. So the only thing that's changing is what you're actually exploding your fuel. And so what we're going to do to kick both of these off is to put a two in front of them. And I'm not going to do both simultaneously, but you know, we're, we're eventually we're going to balance them. And then we're going to balance it in order of carbon, then hydrogen, then oxygen. And the reason why you save oxygen for last is because on the product side, the oxygen is actually split between two different products. It's much easier to focus on the ones that are only in one um, product each because that just is simple, right? Okay. So now let's take care of our carbons. 2 times 5 is 10, which means I'm going to need a 10 in front of my CO2. 2 times 12 is 24, and I've already got 2 on the right, which means I'm going to need a 12 in front of my H2O. Next, I need to add these oxygens up on the right. 10 times 2 is 20. 12 times 1 is 12, which adds up to a total of 32 which means I'm going to need a 16 here. And yes, you can simplify. If all of your coefficients are multiples of two, then we're gonna divide everything by two in the end here. So actually, this is going to become a one. My 16 is going to become an eight. My 10 will become a five. And my 12 will become a 6, like so. If you leave it unsimplified, I, as your teacher, would count points off. But, of course, it depends on what your teacher is actually doing. All right? Feel free to pause this video now before we go into the next example and see if you can do it yourself. But here we go. 2 times 6 is 12. So we're going to put a 12 in front of the CO2. 2 times 14 is 28. Therefore, we're going to put a 14 in front of the H2O, like so. 
Next, we're going to add up our oxygens on the right side. 12 times 2 is 24. 14 times 1, of course, is 14. Add those together, and I get 38. I already have 2 on the left, so 38 divided by 2 is 19. And we cannot simplify this one because of that odd number 19. Therefore, that is what you're stuck with. And you can see with really, really, really odd coefficients how it could be annoying to go back and forth, back and forth, checking one element at a time. So I certainly recommend to Cho. So I'm not going to stay too long on these slides here, uh, but these are excellent, really rapid fire questions for you to go through if you got these slides for yourself, which by the way, once again, down below the video, um, download them for yourself. If you go into presentation mode, let's go ahead and show you what that looks like. Yowzers, right? You can actually go through one reaction at a time, practice recognizing the different mechanisms here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of fancy, kind of cool, right? Um, so feel free, go do that. Excellent practice. But for now, we're going to go on to the next topic, um, and that is net ionic equations, which have lots of uses for the future. But for now, we're, we're just going to look at the actual net ionic equations. And this is very important for understanding what is actually happening in a solution. Because what does it mean for me to dissolve? What is happening when these substances dissolve? Well, what they do is they dissociate. They dissociate, which means that these compounds are going to split apart into the components that make them. Okay? Before we get into this, anything that is a solid, a liquid, or a gas, you are going to keep the exact same. Okay? This is only going to apply to anything that is labeled as aqueous. Only aqueous substances are dissociating, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to do in multiple steps. We're going to start with our equation, our balanced equation. Then we are going to move to the complete ionic equation. And then we are going to move to our net ionic equation, which we will walk through that. But let's look at our first example. We're going to do an example of a single replacement and then a double replacement for you. Here's our single replacement example. Zinc and hydrochloric acid make zinc chloride and hydrogen gas. And would you look at that? It's already balanced for you. So let's take a look at this on the board. Here we are with our first example of a net ionic equation in which we are going to go from our beginning molecular equation to the complete ionic, then followed by the net ionic. So this is multiple steps. There is a shortcut at the end. So after we do these first couple of examples, we'll show you what the shortcut is so that you can go straight from the complete equation, the molecular equation, to the net ionic. But either way, the golden ticket here, the golden rule, is anything that is aqueous is going to dissociate, split up into its ions, because that's what they're actually doing in water. They break apart into their pieces. They've exchanged electrons. They're happy as clams. They don't need each other anymore, so they go their separate ways. It's a very mutual breakup, okay? So, but anything that is solid, liquid, or gas is going to stay the exact same way that it was, because that's what it does when put into solution, when put into water. So this zinc solid is going to stay the exact same. And this, by the way, is us going back or going to the complete ionic equation. Notice here, our HCl is aqueous. Therefore, it's going to split apart into its pieces. We also have to indicate how many pieces there are. Because we've already balanced it, there's now two HCls. So how many hydrogens are going to split apart from this? Two hydrogens. And what's the charge of a hydrogen ion? Positive charge. And your ions are all denoted with an aqueous label as well like so. How many chlorines are going to break off of this? And what is the charge of a chlor chloride ion? Negative charge, like so. Then we're going to go over to the other side. Zinc chloride is aqueous, so this is going to split apart. Zinc is an ion that always has a charge of two. And there are two chlorides breaking off of this compound like so. And then my hydrogen is a gas, so it's going to stay the exact same. This is the complete ionic equation. We are now going to transition to the net ionic equation by crossing out what are called the spectator ions, aka the substances or the species that stay the exact same on both sides of the reaction. So who is that? There's only one spectator in this equation. And the one who stayed the exact same is chlorine. It's an ion on the left, it's an ion on the right. Zinc did not stay the exact same. Zinc was a solid over here, and he's an ion on the right. Hydrogen was an ion over here, and a gas on the right. So the only one to say the exact same is chloride. 
The spectator ions don't actually contribute to the chemical change that we are witnessing. Therefore, they don't matter. That chloride could have been anything else in the chemical universe, and it wouldn't have impacted it, right? All that matters is that the zinc and the hydrogen, what they're doing is they're exchanging electrons. So, now that we've crossed them out, the net ionic equation is just whatever's left over. Like so. And that is single replacement net ionic. And next, our double replacement example. Would you look at that? Already balanced for you and already labeled with your aqueous and precipitate subscripts here. So we know what's going to stay together on the product side. Very, very, very important. Let's tackle it on the board. Here we are with our double replacement example. We have barium nitrate and lithium sulfate reacts to form lithium nitrate and barium sulfate. And we can very quickly balance it by just putting a two here. After this example, I will show you the shortcut on how to tackle these net ionic equations to go straight from here to the net ionic. It's very, very simple. Um, but for now, we have to break apart anything that is aqueous. The only thing in the reaction that's not aqueous is our precipitate product, which is going to be the key to our shortcut at the end. But once again, anything that's aqueous, split it up. There's one barium coming out of this. Barium always has a charge of two. There's two nitrates coming out of this. Do not break up your polyatomic ions. Two nitrates coming out of this. There are two lithiums coming out of this. And there's one sulfate, once again, a polyatomic ion coming out of this. Okay, so the left side has a little bit more work than the product side because we don't have to break up our precipitate. So there are two lithiums coming out of this. And there are two nitrates coming out of this. And then of course our precipitate stays the exact same because it is a solid. Okay. And remember, we are going to cross out our spectator ions, a.k.a. the thing that did not impact the chemistry whatsoever. And that is going to be my lithiums and my nitrates, the things that did not change from left to right. So now, take a look at what your end result is for the net ionic equation. The product side is simply what did not dissolve a.k.a. your precipitate, or in the instance of an acid and base reaction, it would be water, because you can't dissolve water in water. Right? So we ended with our precipitate, and if this is what we ended with, obviously we had to begin with the pieces that made him on the left. Because I can't just come up with it out of thin air. I had to start with the pieces that make the product. If you're going to end with chocolate chip cookies, you had to start with chocolate chips and cookie dough, right? Right? You can't just cookies. No, it doesn't work that way. I can't just barium sulfate. No, I had to have the barium and the sulfate somewhere. So the shortcut, once you have your reaction all drawn out, whatever your precipitate product is, that's the product of your net ionic equation. How many bariums are in barium sulfate? Just one. What's the charge of barium? Two. How many sulfates are in barium sulfate? One. What's the charge of sulfate? Two. Negative two. That's the left side. Easy. One final little concept to tag on to these aqueous solution reactions that we've talked about um, with your single replacement and double replacement examples is that an acid and a base are actually very easy to predict what is going to occur as well. Uh, they are neutralizing each other. Acids can melt your face off. Bases can melt your face off as well. I know that's not commonly talked about in the movies where the bad guy is dangling our hero over a vat of acid. They could just as easily dangle them over a vat of base as well. Um, but what they do is they cancel each other out. They cancel out their harmful properties. And they produce a salt and water every single time. Does that mean that they always produce table salt? 
No, it does not. It just so happens in this example, they are producing table salt. They're going to produce sodium chloride. A salt simply means a cation with an anion, an ionic compound, essentially. That's what we're working with here. But one of the products is always water. The only thing that is potentially going to change from uh, reaction to reaction is the salt. Okay? So acid and base reactions, it is a double replacement reaction. It's a very, very, very predictable uh, reaction as well. Um, and acid-base reactions are actually a type of reaction, not even a mechanism. It is a type of reaction between an acid and a base, which is a huge concept in AP chemistry, a huge concept in AP chemistry. Um, and so it's really cool to know that pattern so early on, a salt and water. It's in all caps for a reason, ladies and gentlemen, all caps for a reason. Let's move on to our final topic of the day, I believe, which is redox reactions, which is another type of reaction. It's not a mechanism. It is a type of reaction. It just so happens that a lot of our mechanisms fold into this. And so what this is, is these are reactions that are caused by the exchanging of electrons. Someone is going to give electrons. Someone is going to receive electrons. And the way we remember this, the way we remember this is with the oil rig. Oxidation is losing. Reduction is gaining. I am oxidized if I lose electrons. I am reduced if I gain electrons. Now, why would they flip that wording? Well, it's because what is the charge of an electron? It's negatively charged. Therefore, it, the term reduction makes sense. It's your charge that is being reduced. Your charge is going down. Your number of electrons is going up, but your charge is going down. Oxidation is the loss of electrons. Another way uh, the people, another mnemonic device, as you say, Leo the Lion goes, grr. <laughs> I don't know of anyone with any status that use, utilizes this mnemonic device. No way. But anyways, what it stands for is loss of electrons is oxidation. Gain of electrons is reduction. I'm not saying that you're not an awesome human being if you utilize this mnemonic device, but that's exactly what I'm saying. Uh, so oil rig all the way, baby. But first of all, before we determine who is losing or gaining electrons, we need to be able to identify what are known as oxidation states. This is essentially finding the charge of an element or a compound. Subtle, subtle difference. And look at all these rules. Oh, my goodness. So many rules. The good news is we don't really have to pay attention to this. What we do have to pay attention to are the main rules. Some elements are bossier than others. That's the important part. Some elements are bossier than others. Fluorine is the bossiest element of them all. Fluorine, absolutely without exception, will always have an oxidation state of negative 1. Just like in any compound that it forms, it always has a charge of negative one. Okay? Oxygen, 99% of the time, unless it's in a compound with itself, or fluorine, will always have an oxidation state of negative two. Okay? So that's something that we're going to rely upon here. And then pretty much everything else, we are just going to look at as if they were in a actual compound, like how we determine the crisscross charges and whatnot. Um, but it is helpful to know alkaline metals and alkaline earth metals will always be plus one or plus two respectively. But the other really important fact to know is this number one rule right here. The oxidation number of a free element, and what that means is an element existing how it naturally does, right? An element existing how it naturally does. Carbon, for example, just exists as carbon. Oxygen is a Brinkelhoff element, so in its free state is O2, right? That is how the element wants to exist on its own. That has an oxidation number of zero. There's no charge to it, essentially. It's neutral, okay? That's how we're going to look at this. So let's tackle these examples on the board, and let's solve them. Remember, bossy elements are going to dictate what's happening here. So oxygen, this whole way through, is a bossy, bossy, bossy element. Okay, the key to finding oxidation states of individual elements in a compound is a very simple mathematical formula because the sum of your oxidation states has to equal the charge of whatever molecule you are looking at. So for all of these polyatomic ions, in the end, I have to add up to negative 2 for sulfate, negative 2 for sulfite, negative 2 for dichromate, and negative 3 for phosphate. But we also have to keep in mind those bossy, bossy elements. And who's the bossy element that's in every single one of these polyatomic ions? Oxygen. And unless oxygen is with itself and or with fluorine, it always has an oxidation number of negative two. It's as simple as that. So what I'm trying to say here is they're never gonna ask you a question on what the oxidation number of oxygen is, most likely. 
they're probably gonna be talking about the other elements in the compound with it because those are the ones that have to be a little more flexible in order to make it work. And so if oxygen is negative two, and there's four of them, what does sulfur have to be in order for this charge to overall be negative two? And so for that, let's go ahead and move this over just a touch, and then you can see what we're working with here. So if the overall charge is negative two, and where did I get that? The charge of the molecule, negative two. And there's four oxygens that each have an oxidation number of negative two. Sulfur is X. What does sulfur have to be in order for this to be a mathematically valid equation? And the answer is positive six. So it's very, very, very simple. Just set your equation equal to the charge of whatever polyatomic ion you're looking at it and solve from there. Oxygen is going to be negative two in all of our examples here. I told you about the two very, very, very rare instances that oxygen is not negative two, and that would be peroxide and oxygen difluoride. Those are the only times where oxygen is, or if oxygen is on its own, but that's not what we're talking about right now. Um, but either way, it's very, very simple to solve it from there. And so then you would see in this equation, because there's one less oxygen, sulfur is only positive four if we solved it out, right? And if we're doing the math here, four oxygens each with an oxidation number of negative two, what does phosphorus have to be to bring it back down to negative three? Well, four times negative two is negative eight. Therefore, phosphorus has to be positive five. The only way it can get a little more tricky is with our third example here. There are two chromiums. Therefore, whatever X has to be, we have to divide that by two. So seven times negative two is negative 14, and we need to get it back down to negative two, which means I need to get a total of positive 12, and 12 divided by two is positive six, like so. In the end, not so bad. It's algebra, people. It's algebra. Next, we're going to apply these terms to an actual reaction, and we're going to determine who lost electrons here versus who gained electrons here. We are adding two new vocab terms, the oxidizing agent, the reducing agent. But we actually already know these terms, right? If you're familiar with what agents do in the sports world with athletes, they advocate for their, their client, right? They advocate for the athlete because if the athlete gets paid, the agent gets paid. So the oxidizing agent is the one who wants their client to be reduced, right? Think of it like this. They're sweet-talking another, another business partner, and they go, hey, listen, you want to get oxidized, my friend. You want to get oxidized. <laughs> because when you get oxidized, we both make money. We both get happy. We both get rich. So whoever is reduced is the oxidizing agent. Whoever is oxidized is the reducing agent. They're just flip-flopped, okay? They're just flip-flopped, no problemo. So we're gonna apply this to this reaction. Let's tackle it on the board. And you know what? We're gonna tackle the next couple of reactions as well. And why have I included this bottom example? Well, it's to show you that not every reaction is a redox reaction, okay? Not every single reaction are electrons being exchanged. And that's very important to note. Let's take a look at this very uh, last one before we go to the board and do our final examples of the day. This is probably the easiest way that these are formatted. Uh, and no, it is not balanced, uh, and that, that's for a number of reasons, right? The charges have to balance each other on the left and the right um, side of the reaction. That is a concept that AP Chemistry really, really uh, explores more in depth upon, and I would love to do it in a future video. But we'll, we'll keep things simple for this one. Uh, but either way, it's very easy to determine who is oxidized and who is reduced. Uh, but what this is actually going to be doing is separating it into the oxidation half and reduction half reactions, right? The oxidation half reaction is obviously showing who is giving electrons, right? Who is losing them. And then the reduction reaction is obvious. The reduction half reaction is obviously showing who is gaining the electrons. But in the end, in the end, if we combine those, we're going to see that the same amount of electrons that were lost were also taken up somewhere. If you want to lose electrons, you can't just cast them out of your atom uh, in, in just throw them for them to be homeless. No, they have to have a home, okay? They have to have a home. Uh, but we'll, we'll show this on the board as well. Uh, but either way, it's very easy to determine this, right? Because iron starts out as an ion, positive ion, and it becomes, 
its free state element, right? Neutral. Okay, so its charge went from two to zero, aka it went down. So he got reduced. Yeah. Silver goes from free state element to cation, so it goes from charge of zero, oxidation state of zero, to plus one. So it went up means it lost electrons it was oxidized <laughs> either way let's go to the board here we are with two examples of redox where we are going to identify who is reduced who is oxidized and then who is the oxidizing agent and who is the reducing agent in all of these uh, reactions and we're starting off with a couple familiars right zinc and hydrochloric acid make zinc chloride and hydrogen gas and then of course the synthesis of water okay and the key thing here is, is any element in its free state has an oxidation number of zero. So which elements, which species are existing how they naturally would in the world? And that would be zinc in this reaction and hydrogen in this reaction. They both have oxidation numbers of zero. It's when we are given them in compounds that we know that they can't have oxidation numbers of zero. So once we get to compounds like this, then it's just their charges that we would have specified them with uh, in the previous unit with nomenclature and whatnot. And hydrogen always has a charge of plus one and chlorine always has a charge of negative one. Yes, there's a two in front of them, so it's a total of positive two from hydrogen and a total of negative two from chlorine. But that's irrelevant. All we want to see is a change in the elements from left to right. And then over here, zinc in a compound always has a charge of two and chlorine still has that charge of negative one. And yes, there are two of them in order to balance out that positive two from zinc, but that's irrelevant. So who doesn't change here? The answer is chlorine. Chlorine was negative one on the left, chlorine was negative one on the right. It was in a compound on both sides, which is a pretty good indicator. Not a 100% law, but a pretty good indicator that nothing happened to it. Therefore, the only options for who is oxidized, who's reduced are zinc and hydrogen. And here's the deal, it has to be how the element existed on the reactant side. They love to bait you in with multiple choice questions and give you zinc, ion, or H2 gas as the result of whoever was oxidized or reduced. They can't have been, they could not have been oxidized or reduced because this is what they turn into after that process occurs. So my only answer is either zinc solid or hydrogen ion. But which is which? Let's determine. Zinc solid was blank. And then hydrogen plus was. So you cannot pick anything that exists on the product side. Zinc is an ion on the product side and hydrogen is a gas on the product side. So they can't be answers here. Okay. So zinc solid goes from zero to positive two. His charge goes up, which means he lost electrons. When you lose electrons, that is known as oxidation. So we're gonna say that he was oxidized. And remember that if you are oxidized, you are also the reducing agent, which I'm just going to abbreviate RA here, was oxidized, and I'll put a little slash to show you that. And then hydrogen ion goes from plus one to zero. His charge went down, his charge was reduced, therefore hydrogen was reduced. And if you are the species that was reduced, then you are also the oxidizing agent, like so. Okay? So then we get down here to the bottom, and we see that hydrogen and oxygen are both existing in their elemental free states on the reactant side. So this one is very, very simple. Because then when they get into the compound with one another, oxygen is always negative 2, hydrogen is positive 1. Therefore, we can see very clearly that hydrogen, his charge was increased and oxygens was decreased. Therefore, hydrogen H2 gas was oxidized slash reducing agent and O2 was reduced oops, slash oxidizing agent. Very simple. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes our talk on types and mechanisms of reaction. We hope you'll come back. We hope you have enjoyed your stay here. This is actually the final video that I've had to record.
for this curriculum. It's been the most exciting chapter of my life. Last I checked, I've reached a whopping 74 subscribers. I'm about to phone into the school district and say, I'm not coming in on Monday. You can't make me. I'm a, I'm a big timer on YouTube now. And then I slam the phone down. Superintendent calls me up and says, we'll triple your pay. Sorry, YouTube already multiplied it by 10. Squared. <laughs> Peasant.